Good afternoon. So we have a new day, new theme. Uh, today we have um, the presentation from Dr. Zashad Ahmed about pulse IV characterization. Um, yeah, happy that you joined us today again. I see some names that are familiar in the meantime. Um, Dr. Sajad Ahmed, um, he f finished his uh, university and he, he made his degree in France at Exlin. Um, he has experience also here in, from Europe and worked and lived a couple of years here in, I think in Munich, right? Yes. yes. Okay, wonderful. Good. Good location. Um, he's back in Canada now and he's uh, in charge of business development management at Focus Microwave. And he's, um, well, one of the, the, yeah, the real experts in load pull measurement. So thank you. And well, it's yours. Okay. Thank you, Rola. So, should we should I start or should I wait for some time? Ah, uh, well, I see some people still coming in. Um, okay. I would say um, we have three o'clock here European time, one minute past the hour. So let's start. Uh, what, 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 one more, one remark maybe. If you have questions, you can put them in the uh, in the chat window, and I will collect them. And I will, yes, yeah, and we will um, look through the questions at the end after the presentation together. Go, okay. go ahead, Sajad. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Roland. Thank you, Remy. So my name is uh, Dr. Sajad, and I'm the business development manager here at Focus Microwaves. So I'll be talking about some pulsed IV uh, crystallization today. So actually, I'll... Close my camera for now. Yep. Okay. So let's start. So my talk will include some uh, basics of IV characterization. Then I'll be talking out about some uh, pulse signal and uh, why is it important when we are talking about IV characterization some high power applications using uh, pulsed IV, the pulsed S parameters, and the introduction to compact modeling. So uh, IV characterization or IV characteristic curves. Now, as the name suggests, you know, so this is basically uh, the relationship between the current flowing through an electronic circuit and the voltage applied across its terminals. Now, IV characteristic curves are generally used as a tool to determine and understand the basic parameters of a component or a device. And this information can also be used to mathematically model its behavior within an electronic circuit. Now in the represented circuit here, if we see, if a voltage V uh, applied across the resistive element R is varied, we can determine the current flowing into the circuit. So this uh, current uh, voltage relationship is basically computed using the simple Ohm's law. Now, uh, as we can see, if the resistor uh, within this circuit is kept, uh, is a fixed value or is kept constant, the resulting curve, which can be graphically represented, is a linear value, which means it is a straight line. But when we are talking about uh, advanced electronic components, the relationship between the voltage and current is no more linear, which means that uh, it's not a straight line. So let's take an example of semiconductor devices. So semiconductors such as diodes or transistors, they are all constructed using uh, PN junctions. And if uh, we want to have their IV characteristics, they will basically reflect the operation of these PN junctions. The circuit represented here is an E MOSFET, and it's a three terminal device. So if we want to uh, characterize uh, or have the IV characterization of this circuit, so one of the terminals is kept constant. For example, here, uh, for example, if you see, so the VGS is kept constant and the V drained source is linearly varied. And 
we have the resulting uh, drain current. Now, looking into this uh, curve, we see that it can be uh, divided into two regions, the ohmic region and the saturation region. In the linear region, which is the ohmic uh, region, the conduction channel basically acts like a resistor. So if we continue to increase the voltage, the channel potential will reduce the current. And we will get to a point where we no longer see any change in this current. This region is called the saturation region. Now for typical IV measurements, this measurement is repeated for multiple gate uh, voltages. And we have the final IV uh, characteristics of that device. Other IV tests may also include some transfer characteristic measurements. Now transfer characteristic measurements uh, is the relationship between the gate source voltage and the drain current where VDS is kept constant. So in DC IV measurements, basically uh, a series of voltage varied over time is applied to the device. And at each voltage, uh, the current flowing through the device is measured. This continuous cycle increases the device temperature. Now, due to this change in temperature or due to the rise in temperature within the device, the device parameters or the transistor parameters will have a slightly different response. And they might exhibit memory of the previous signal, which means you know it might be dependent upon whatever state it was uh, at previous uh, voltage levels. So this behavior is uh, also termed as thermal memory. And of course, it's an undesired behavior. So when we look into the DC IV curves of a transistor, we see that the in the saturation region, the current decreases. Now, this is why the reason for this is the bulk temperature within the device starts increasing, which affects the mobility of carriers in the channel, and it decreases the flow of current into the device. Now, to avoid these thermal effects, basically, a pulsed DC characterization is a preferred method for IV characterization. So, what is a pulsed signal? So, a pulsed uh, signal is basically uh, the bias point for both gate and drain that goes through a rapid transient change in voltage amplitudes starting from a base value and it's a it's a periodic signal which means it repeats itself and for a pulse signal the two uh, parameters that the user can control are pulse width and the pulse period and the two dependent parameters based on uh, these two parameters are the duty cycle, which is basically the relationship between, or it's the ratio between the pulse width and the time period, and it's represented as a percentage, and the pulse repetition frequency, which is directly dependent upon the pulse repetition uh, rate, which is the pulse period. So when we are talking about uh, pulsed IV characterization, it's always desired that the pulse width is kept very, very small. So that uh, the thermal time constant is much less than the thermal effects happening within the device. But here, if we see that even if we keep the pulse uh, width very small and the pulse repetition frequency is high, we see that the temperature between pulse to pulse keeps on increasing, which of course is not a good, <clears throat> uh, which, which is not required or which is not desired. So what is important is on top of the uh, narrow pulse width, we should also have a high time period. So which means that the pulse period should be much, much greater than the pulse width. In this case, if we see uh, the temperature rising within or temperature rising within one pulse does not effectively add up to the next one. So this is why we call it a quasi isothermal uh, measurement. Now, how do we do uh, the typical pulsed IV characteristics? So the static DC point for both gate and drain voltages on which the pulses are superimposed is referred to as the quiescent point. Now this quiescent point basically determines the class of the amplifier it's operating on, and it also determines the uh, thermal state of the transistor. Now starting from this quiescent point for both gate and drain, we sweep the uh, non-quiescent voltage amplitudes 
for the gate and for each gate value we perform a subsequent uh, drain non quiescent sweeps and this measurement is repeated for multiple gate values and finally we have the complete iv uh, characteristic or iv network of that particular device so now when we are talking about you know the recent industries wide band gap semiconductors so in in those devices now temperature is not the only physical characteristics that uh, give rise to dispersion effects within the devices there is another effect that is called trapping effects and which is often uh, related to uh, uh, some uh, malfunctioning of the materials so these memory effects or these trapping effects are also uh, responsible for short and long term memory effects so when we can control the uh, different parameters in the pulsed iv characteristics it enables us to determine basically the electron emission times related to the different regions within our iv network for example when we want to characterize gate lag so we control the uh, quiescent bias points of the drain voltage and we keep the non quiescent voltage constant similarly when we want to characterize the drain lag we uh, sweep the non quiescent drain voltages and keep the gate quiescent voltages fixed so for a good pulse iv system we should have uh, control over all uh, the parameters within the pulse so in this slide i will be uh, talking about some uh, uh, what is a pulsed iv measurement system so here it represents uh, the basic block diagram of the uh, origa's fifth generation pulsed iv system so a pulsed iv system basically consists of three building blocks the pulse generation digitizer and the timing control the pulse generation basically is uh, are the fast switches that basically generate the pulses at both gate and drain as uh, we said uh, the pulse in in pulse characterization the pulse width can be very narrow which means that uh, the measurements or the settling time for the measurements is very very uh, slow so we need to have fast measurement system so that's why a fast digitizer is equipped within this uh, system so that we can have good stable measurements within the pulse and the third main uh, a very important block is the timing control the timing control block is basically the fundamental controlling element for the digitizers and for the electronic switches that connect the four uh, dc supplies to generate the quiescent and non quiescent voltages <clears throat> the uh, fifth generation origa pulse iv system basically is a fully featured characterization platform uh, it it is capable of measuring the dc iv curves you can measure the pulsed iv curves and this system can be expanded to uh, pulsed s parameter measurements uh, and even pulsed load pull measurements so when we are talking about uh, pulsed iv characterization so each uh, application is specific to certain parameters and the parameters could be uh, the maximum and minimum voltage and current ratings it could be a maximum uh, or the minimum specified pulse width the maximum pulse repetition frequency or the maximum output power so uh, origa offers a range of pulsar heads both for gate and drain for example for gate we offer two different heads plus minus 20 volt 100 milliampere and the plus minus 100 volt 2 ampere head similarly for the drain side again we offer a range of uh, pulsar heads starting from 220 volt 2 ampere and we go all the way to 2 kilovolt 100 ampere for high power applications the pulse width can be as narrow as 200 nanoseconds and the duty cycle uh, within the system can be varied from 0.01% to 100% the pulse repetition frequency again plays a very very important role to quantify the emission time constant so the pulse repetition frequency again is different for different pulsar heads and uh, 
the difference is why because it is uh, related to the thermal dissipation within each head so now uh, talking about the quality of pulse that is uh, generated using uh, these pulsar heads so theoretically you know it is desired that uh, or an, in an ideal situation that the pump uh, that the pulse turns on and off instantaneously and right uh, as it is turned on we should achieve the maximum voltage that is set by the uh, user but in reality that does not happen there is always a rise and a fall time associated with the pulse so this rise and fall time is basically you know how long the pulse takes to reach its maximum value a good pulsar is designed to minimize these fast and rise uh, uh, fast rise and fall times but there is another another thing or another phenomena that is associated with these rise and fall times which is the ripple so the faster the rise time the more the ripples are and what are these ripples these ripples are basically overshoot and undershoot and overshoot is defined you know uh, is it's a voltage level that exceeds your target level right after the pulse is turned on similarly after that it goes below the target value and it comes back so this it kind of oscillates before it settles down so this oscillation period is called ripple and it is directly related to how fast your pulsar turns on so the faster the rise time the faster the ripple and if we have a huge ripple within the pulse it means that the measurement time or the stable time within the pulse becomes very very short and we won't have enough uh, time to make good stable measured uh, measurements within the pulse so for a good pulsar head for a good system it is desired to have minimal ripple and the maximum possible rise and fall times so this slide represents a typical uh, pulse generated by the origa measurement system here we can see that the effective rise and fall time uh, is around 50 nanoseconds for this pulsar head and here we see that the pulse is pretty clean so there are there is minimal ripple there is minimal overshoot and this of course is required why if we have a very clean pulse we can make measurements much closer to the transient state so which gives us uh, better isothermal measurements and it also gives us a wider sampling time so that we can have a good average signal within the pulse now as the pulse width becomes narrow so here it's represented at 200 nanosecond pulse width we'll see that we'll end up with a rounded kind of a shape this is why the reason for this is that the rise and the fall time of the pulsar head is around 50 nanoseconds which means that we have a very small measurement window within this within the pulse so if this pulse is not clean and we have some ripples and overshoots here the measurement within this pulse will not be stable now when we are talking about iv sweeps there is an another important uh, point that we need to take care of is when defining the pulse timings for our measurement system so origa allows to set uh, multiple uh, different settings and different delays for both great and the drain pulses and it also allows you to uh, control the quiescent and non quiescent voltages within these pulsar heads now when we are talking about the iv uh, sweep settings of the pulse there can be certain cases where the gate and the drain pulses are uh, not of equal uh, weight that we might create some intermediate stages which are neither quiescent nor non quiescent state now usually these intermediate states are not harmful but there could be a condition where the intermediate stage uh, can be destructive to the dot Uh, the following analysis uh, will explain how these intermediate states occur and why they need to be understood so we'll talk about two different scenarios the first one is where the quiescent drain voltage is less than the non quiescent drain voltage so here we see that we have the gate pulse and the drain pulse so the quiescent for the 
uh, drain voltage is lower than the non quiescent voltage and again the drain pulse is narrower than the gate pulse which means that the gate pulse turns on first now here we see that starting from the quiescent bias point so where the quiescent current is flowing into the device which is this region which is this region we see that the gate non quiescent pulse will turn on it means we will create an intermediate stage which is neither quiescent nor non quiescent so we'll jump to a new gate uh, non quiescent voltage before we really hit our target which is the non quiescent voltage for both gate and drain so here you can see that we created this intermediate stage but as far as this intermediate stage is within the safety settings of the system this is not uh, it's it's benign it's not harmful for the pulse iv setup similarly for the off state again we will jump to the intermediate stage and then back to the quiescent value the second condition where we uh, what we will discuss is where the drain uh, pulse is wider than the gate non quiescent voltage which means here that the drain non quiescent will turn on first and then the gate non quiescent again here we see starting from a quiescent value we will jump to a higher drain quiescent voltage and then we will move to our uh, target non quiescent iv condition iv uh, set target the third condition is where we have uh, the gate and the drain pulses of equal weights so here actually we don't create any uh, intermediate stage and we directly jump from our quiescent to our target value the second condition here that we will discuss uh, where and this is the condition where we can have some problems this is the condition where the quiescent drain voltage is greater than the non quiescent drain voltage so here we can see that the drain quiescent is at a very very high level so starting from the quiescent uh, current we see that drain is at a very high quiescent if the gate non quiescent turns on first it means we will jump on to a higher gate value and there could be certain conditions where we are beyond the safety settings of our system now this is hazardous for the device this can destroy the device so this is of course uh, not something uh, that should be done and then you know we will shift but this will never happen so the uh, when so the idea here is when defining the time of the pulse it's important that we take care of these intermediate stages though origa will not let the system go out of its safety setting as it will abort the measurements so the device will be kept safe for the other two cases where your uh, gate pulse is narrower than the drain pulse in that case we create an intermediate stage but that is much within uh, the safety limits of our system so it's benign similarly when we have equal gate and uh, drain pulses again we do not create any intermediate stage and we jump directly between our quiescent and our non quiescent iv characteristics so now as uh, we were talking about the pulse quality so when we are uh, talking about the real measurement scenario uh, in the real measurement scenario we do add some you know adapters connectors biases between our pulsar head and our measurement reference plane which is the dut reference plane so all these adapters cables and biases they you know add to some parasitic inductance parasitic capacitance and even the parasitic resistance so this parasitic inductance and parasitic capacitance basically it adds uh, to the overshoots it increases the rise time of the pulse and of course uh, because of the ripple the settling time increases within the pulse so which means we have if we have a narrow pulse we might not even have a stable region within the pulse another important point here uh, that should be discussed is that all the components uh, you know within the pulsar head uh, between uh, the dc supplies and the output of the pulsar head you know they do have certain resistivity which means you know because there are some buyers there is switch on resistance uh there are some measurement resistors so the addition of all these you know parasitic resistors make the output impedance of this pulsar head 
So this out, output impedance varies for different pulsar heads and it is on, on the lower side. It is around one ohm, two ohm uh, levels. Now what happens that when uh, current that is flowing through the output resistance you know, uh, of this uh, circuit, it creates a voltage drop. So the measurement that is set at the uh, at the uh, power supplies, you might not see that voltage at the output of the pulsar head. But this does not affect your measurement as whatever, because all this offset is happening much before the measurement circuitry. So whatever is being measured by, measured by the circuit or measured by the digitizer is basically the true voltage that is being set at your measurement reference plane or or that is basically set at your duty reference plane. So this offset uh, does not affect your measurement. So the last point here that I will talk about is the parasitic, parasitic resistance. So this parasitic resistance can always be calibrated out. How? So let's take an example here that for a measurement case here between our device and our pulsar head, we have a cable, a bias T, maybe some adapters, then again a cable until we reach our DOT reference plane. So for this path, we can always calculate the path resistance of this entire path. There are multiple uh, methods available uh, to calculate this input and output path resistance. So once these uh, input and output resistances are known, we can define these resistance in our software and then the software automatically compensates for this offset. So once we have defined these offsets or once we have defined these uh, resistance values, the voltage that the user sets at the power supply level is the voltage that you should measure at your measurement reference plane. Uh, another method of uh, doing uh, similar measurements is that our software allows is called servo. Servo is basically an iterative process. So it means, you know, it allows to very precisely set voltages, you know, at your measurement reference plane. So when user sets a target value, it will be measured by uh, the digitizer. And if it does not meet the uh, target value, the, the, the software will reiterate and try to adjust its, its power supply so that it meets the target value at the measurement reference plane. Now, uh, talking about the, uh, the digitizer within the Origa Pulse IV setup. So the digitizer basically, you know, it returns the calibrated values across the portion of the waveform that is uh, displayed on the scope. Now, this portion is, of course, set by the user. And usually, you know, it is set, uh, set within the stable region where the pulse uh, becomes uh, pretty stable. So uh, for both non-quiescent portion of the pulse and the quiescent, quiescent uh, portion of the pulse. So these small segments are called basically the apertures. So we have both non-quiescent aperture and the quiescent aperture. And the final values that are displayed in the IV characteristic curve are basically the calibrated and averaged values within these time segments. Now, on top of uh, the digitizer or the uh, digital values that we see in the IV curves, Origa is equipped with the uh, with an oscilloscope which has 16-bit resolution and a very fast sampling rate of 200 megahertz. So now uh, this option allows to have complete time domain waveforms or time domain pulses for each measured IV uh, curve. So uh, what happens is here is you know that the measurement signal can be plotted you know versus time so which allows us to notice any time varying changes occurring you know that might occur due to self heating or trapping so we have the entire pulse uh, pulse shape and we might see you know in some cases that the pulse starts decreasing or it might have some other effect so the origa because of the fast sampling uh, rate of origa we can view all these changes within our pulsar heads. Another uh, enhanced measurement, measurement technique or a mode that Origa offers is called measurement enhancement mode. 
Now this uh, feature basically is implemented because the fast uh, scope that is a part of the uh, digitizer that might undergo you know, some significant drift and jitters. So what MEM does is uh, it uses a digital multimeter to correlate the jittery oscilloscope measurements with a very stable uh, DMM digital multimeter measurements through very advanced calibration uh, algorithms. So in the end, you know what, because of this mode, we get a very high resolution of uh, current, which is around 0 0.01 of the maximum current. And we get very stable measurements for longer period of time. Now, when we are talking about, uh, you know, the emerging high power applications, so it is very important for a pulsed IV system, you know, to withstand very large voltage and current ratings. And at the same time, uh, fast switching is uh, fast switching speed is always desired. Now, to fulfill this fulfill this requirement, the uh, Origa system offers again uh, multiple heads uh, that include 1200 volt 100 ampere, 1200 volt 10 ampere, or even uh, 2 kilovolt 100 ampere head. These pulsar heads offer a minimum pulse width of around one microsecond and a rise and fall time of around 84 nanoseconds. These uh, properties make these pulsar heads a very, very unique product presently available in the market. Uh, for high power applications, you know, a very uh, common test that is performed in the industry is called dynamic on resistance measurement. Now, what is this dynamic on resistance measurement? Now, this is basically, you know, uh, that during a measurement, high power measurement, the device is uh, kept under stress for some time before it is turned on. And by stress, it means that the non quiescent voltage, the non quiescent drain voltage is kept at a very, very high level before the device is turned on. Uh, again, as we discussed before, the pulse timing in this case are very, very important. So we might, we should uh, take care that we don't create an intermediate stage that is harmful for the device. So here, the drain non quiescent pulse is much wider than the gate non quiescent pulse, which means that uh, if we, even if we create an intermediate stage, that is well within the uh, safety limits of the setup. Now, uh, you know, in one of the papers, it is published, uh, the complete, you know, the different characterizations of the dynamic on resistance measurement and what factors it basically depends upon. So uh, it is reported that R on is, uh, you know, affected under two different conditions, which is, you know, the, uh, what is the R on right after the transition state? So as soon as the pulse turns on. So it means, you know, the R on is measured at multiple uh, timestamps within the pulse and then the R on at different time states uh, are compared. And the second is, is the time period of the applied stress, which means for how long the device was kept at a high uh, drain non quiescent voltage. Now for this uh, uh, results that were published in this paper, a very long pulse width was used. And now if we scan through the different timestamps within this pulse, we see that at 200 nanoseconds, which is right at the transition stage, the uh, dynamic on resistance is very, very high. And at 10, uh, at 10 microseconds, the on resistance starts decreasing. And at 10 milliseconds, it, is, uh, it has stabilized itself very much. And the R on measured at 10 milliseconds is almost similar to the on resistance that is measured for the DC signal. So without the uh, pulse characterization, which is the DC IV characterization. So which means that the R on is most effective or is, uh, it's, it's good to characterize R on right at the transition state. The next result that is uh, published here is the applied stress that how, uh, long the stress was applied and what were the results seen. So for this uh, particular case, they applied the stress for almost 40 minutes. And we see that until 30 minutes, there is no significant change in the R on or the ID max. Sorry. 
So we don't see any significant change until 30 minutes, but beyond 30 minutes, we see that the R on an ID max have significantly degraded. Similarly here, we see that until 30 minutes, right after the transition, the R1, R on was high, but after 30 minutes, it increased uh, quite a bit. Similarly, for a different timestamp, which is 10 microseconds, it still keeps on increasing. And for uh, 10 milliseconds, that is well within the stable region and well deep into the pulse. The R on is almost ineffective and almost same as uh, the R on resistance measured in the DC analysis. So another uh, important application of a pulsed IV measurement system is the pulsed S parameter measurements. The principle of these pulsed S parameter measurements basically consists of superimposing the RF signal on each instantaneous bias point. And, at, uh, and, and for each bias point within that IV network, an acquisition of the S parameter measurement is done. So this, uh, for this measurement, the pulsed IV system is synchronized with a vector network analyzer. The, uh, the pulse IV system acts as the primary trigger and uh, the delays within the vector network analyzers are, you know, uh, adequately used so that, you know, we, uh, the, the pulsed S parameter measurements are always made within the stable regions within the pulse. So this, the choice of IF uh, bandwidth and delay has to be very precise. Uh, for, uh, in terms of vector network analyzers, Origa sports multiple VNAs that include uh, all uh, uh, Keysight and Roden Schwartz VNAs. Similarly, the measurement can, store, can be stored in different formats, in city file, CSV formats, or the S2P format files. So here, you know, it's, it represents the graph, the entire graph of the uh, graphical display of the pulse IV measurements, we can see we have the IV characteristic curves, we have the time domain waveforms, we have the digital representation of each and every point, and we have the pulse S parameter results. These S parameter measurements basically are uh, the uh, measurements that are done in the pulse mode, and they give the actual response of the device at each uh, quotient bias point. Now, another important application of uh, pulsed IV measurements is compact modeling. So here, you know, uh, this figure basically represents the classical small signal hemp model. Uh, so here we can see it is mainly composed of voltage controlled current source and some passive linear components. So the electrical model here, it can be divided into two different planes, the intrinsic plane and the extrinsic plane. So each intrinsic and extrinsic plane has a set of almost eight elements. The intrinsic plane is basically uh, used to model the uh, active part of this device and the extrinsic plane is used to model the passive part. The S parameter measurements, so uh, for uh, the compact modeling, both pulse IV measurements and uh, Pulsed S parameter and pulsed IV measurements are required. So the pulsed S parameter measurements basically uh, data or the pulse S parameter that is measured, it models the linear response of all the extrinsic and extrinsic lumped element networks. So once this model uh, is done, that is pretty much valid for all the small signal uh, conditions. But for nonlinear analysis, you know, we have to uh, model all the nonlinear capacitances and the nonlinear current source. So the nonlinear uh, capacitance are, uh, capacitances are modeled over the assumed load line, while the nonlinear current source is purely modeled using the pulsed IV data. The focus uh, software suit, you know, uh, offers two different uh, uh, models to model the nonlinear current elements, which are the Angelo's nonlinear current source model and Tajima's uh, nonlinear current source model. So now when we are talking about modeling, you know, uh, all the uh, intrinsic and extrinsic uh, parameters that we have to model, you know, they can be uh, tuned manually or our software also allows uh, optimization techniques. 
So here it's it's a small video that explains how each uh, individual element can be tuned manually or you can uh, use the uh, built-in optimization techniques. So here, once the optimization is, com optimization is complete, the results can be saved. Similarly here, uh, it's represented one example of the current source model. So on the left uh, is a figure where no optimization technique was performed and on the right it's with the optimization so the iv curves for the uh, generated model so uh, the focus compact model also offers a complete uh, schematic or a complete uh, 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 information that can be exported to any uh, uh, any of the uh, simulation environment that includes both ADS and microwave office. A complete template is provided with the system. So here is an example of the simulated and the modeled data for the generated model. And finally, I will uh, talk about some pulsed load pool uh, system. You know, as we talked about uh, the pulsed IV condition. So in pulsed load pool, the pulse signal also plays a very, very important role when we are talking about large signal device characterization. So in large signal device characterization, you know, for high power devices, they might uh, have some self-heating and memory effect issues that can severely affect the performance of uh, or the uh, performance of the power amplifier. So their pulse signals, again, pulse, both pulse DC and pulse RF play a very, very important role. So with these uh, pulse signals, you know, the device can be operated at higher peak levels. Uh, you know, we can uh, control the temperature uh, much better using these pulse signals. Uh, also, the pulse signals become very, very important, you know, where huge heat, heat sinks cannot be utilized. For example, when we are talking about on wafer measurements, you know, for on wafer measure, measurements, heat sinks cannot be implemented. So the pulse signal becomes very handy in those conditions. Uh, similarly, pulse load pull also plays a very, very important role when we are uh, when we have to validate our compact model. So here I'll uh, stop my presentation. And if you have any questions, please 